we've got Meb Faber coming up, and uh, John did a little bit of the intro, but uh, his website is where I'd go, mabanefaber.com, formerly, what was it called, worldbeta.com, or something like that, but it's, okay, jerks. It's a great website. Um, there is a ton of uh, research on there, both proprietary that, that Meb does, and uh, also via the Idea Farm, he distributes research um, that others are producing uh, in a uh, uh, narrated or curated fashion, which uh, I really appreciate because there's a lot of noise out there and it's good to get a filter. Um, Meb lives in LA, but he's got the uh, unfortunate history of coming from Colorado and being a Broncos fan who were annihilated by my Seattle Seahawks, the Super Bowl. But beyond that, he's an all-around great guy. And I look forward to hearing from him today. And we'll be doing a panel uh, after his presentation in Q&A. So, Meb. The, the worst part about that is my partner is also a Seahawks fan. So I, when I got back from um, vacation, I found a big Seahawks uh, Framed Sports Illustrated cover in my office, um, and I was at the game, so it was even more depressing. Um, is there a clicker? Um, all right, great. So I'm going to fly through this. This is a nice, intimate audience, so if you see something, raise your hand or want to stop me, uh, feel free, because uh, I usually go through this pretty quick. Um, I think we have about 45 minutes, right? I need to set my clock. All right. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? We've already heard a little bit about valuations and stock market valuations, um, and it's good, great to be here this year. I was an attendee last year. Um, my name has been in the media a lot lately, uh, a little bit different Meb, um, but uh, a, good, a good month for Mebs everywhere, um, winning the Boston Marathon, first American in, in a really long time. Um, but as one of my friend's moms remarked when I had posted a link to this, she's like, I didn't even know you ran. Um, <laughs> congratulations. I said, well, I'm, you know, longest I've run in the last year is about six miles, certainly not 26. Uh, again, there's a lot of writing you can track if, for those of you I haven't met. Um, again, my blog, Meb Faber, uh, the website where, where my work uh, side of things, Cambria Funds. Um, and by the way, uh, we just published our third book. Um, I'm happy to send any of you uh, free books if you want them but you got to promise to read them and of course give me a book report um but there's three of them first one published traditionally the last two self-published they're all on amazon um but email me and I'm, I'm happy to give you a free one what we're talking about today is included more in depth in the in the latest book um global value and in a bit about it, in my firm based in la we're a money manager so this isn't theoretical for me you know we, we actually are, are doing a lot of this um I put 100% of my net worth in, in our funds, so it's, it's not um, simply just an academic exercise for me, but it's, it's very real. Uh, our goal is to disrupt the traditional high-fee mutual fund business, um, mutual fund and hedge fund business, uh, mostly through launching ETFs. Um, I wanted to take a step before we get started on the talk today and mention something that you know, kind of came up last night and as we were watching the, the great film yesterday, which is sort of unintended effects. And there's a lot of great takeaways from this chart, and I'll explain it in a minute. It's from um, good friends at O'Shaughnessy, a uh, wonderful research shop. You know, Jim wrote one of the Bibles on quant stock investing, and his son, uh, Patrick, is now participating uh, in, in a great read. You should follow both of them. Um, but what this chart is showing is historical valuation. The blue line is dividend stocks. So this is top. I think it's top quintile. So top 20% of stocks, large, these are large stocks, the valuation relative to the overall market. And the green line is just zero. So relative to the S&P. And what you've seen over time is that dividend stocks traditionally trade at about a 20 to 30% discount to the overall market. This is one of the reasons why dividend stock, investing in dividend stocks work great. It's a value factor. You're getting a value bent to your companies. And it kind of waxes and wanes. And a couple things to notice is that in the late 90s, you had the fattest pitch ever for valuation that we've seen in the past, let's call it 50 years, on a relative basis. No one wanted dividend stocks, right? Late 90s, everyone's talking tech. You're having a market, huge market cap bubble based on tech stocks, other companies. Dividends were just, 
sitting there waiting to be had. Dividend stocks really didn't have a bear market 2000, 2003. They kind of just cruised through it. But as you've had this, you know, someone say Fed induced um, movement of yields from, you know, in the late 70s, 80s, double digits all the way back down to um, where we are now in the low single digits. By the way, if anyone saw before dinner last night, Die Hard was on. I, mean, I was talking about this at dinner in the room and I was watching it. And there's a scene where, the, and this is in the 80s, where they're stealing, the whole concept is they're stealing bonds, right? Bear bonds. And there's a great quote where the guy who's stealing them says, this is going to be so great. We're going to move. And I tried to look it up to play it today, but I couldn't find it on YouTube. Um, this is so great. We're going to move to a tropical island and just collect our 20%, um, which is kind of funny because <laughs> you made that movie today, it'd be 2%. and It wouldn't be as attractive, right? Thieves, thieves have moved on from bearer bonds. Anyway, but so this is a very interesting chart because this massive discount you had as money has chased yield, as there's been a smaller and smaller opportunity set of things to invest in, you've had dividend stocks go from a 60% discount to the overall market to what's now not only a, no longer a discount, but a premium. Okay? So dividend stocks, you're investing this just based on dividend yield alone, are now trading at a premium to the overall market, which is not something you want. So there's a couple great takeaways. One is that alpha or smart beta, whatever you want to call it, that factors, they change over time, right? It's like a swarm of bees. Sometimes it's better to have a great valuation um, bent, and other times you may be investing in something you don't think. So mom, pa, retiree who are investing in these high yield dividend stocks at 2%, 3%, may just be getting over leveraged companies, and that's going to be really painful potentially going forward. You don't have to believe me. You can go to Morningstar, type in your favorite ETF, favorite mutual fund, They'll give you the um, characteristics of that fund. VIG, the largest uh, ETF based on, on dividend yield, ironically has a dividend yield about what the S&P 500 is, um, but on every valuation metric is more expensive. So arguably, the people that have 10, 20 billion invest in that fund um, are going to get something different. And so if you go back and look at the last year, for example, one of the reasons dividend stocks have out underperformed so much is because they're expensive and don't necessarily do great in a rising rate environment. Um, I'm a little biased. We like shareholder yield, which includes buybacks. The only caveat to this is if you're going to use a dividend focus, you should use a valuation filter. You know, so, so at least pick cheap dividend stocks. That's totally separate than the just expensive ones. All right, so what are we getting into today? Um, you know, talking about investing, you hear all sorts of different things. It's like talking politics or religion, um, things I will try to never do. Um, I won't be talking really too much about economics or the Fed today. Uh, things that I'm, I'm in really not qualified to talk about, um, but have an open mind. There's some things that you know, you'll know you very likely disagree with. Okay, um, so as an intro, you know, thinking about investing, first of all, you're a terrible investor, and this is not pointing out you or you or you, but collectively, investors are horrible at investing. These are the Dalbar studies. This is replicated in many different forms. Morningstar does this where they show uh, dollar-weighted versus um, time-weighted returns, and investors are really horrific at timing. Um, they just came out with the new updated ones, and, and typically, investors in every asset class that compare equities to you know, the broad market underperform by an incredible margin, typically because they do the wrong things at the wrong time, as well as paying high fees. But, but the main one is wrong things at the wrong time. This is a chart of sentiment, right? AAII tracks this back to the late 80s. Ask a simple question, are you bullish, are you bearish, are you neutral? Um, and I haven't updated this this year, so I expect these values to be a little bit different, but the red X is the average, the green star is where we are now. Um, this is, the, again, at the end of the year, so this will change, but it's not my point. My point is, of the range, if you look at when people were most bullish, January 2000, the absolute worst time to be bullish, when were they most bearish? March of 2009, right? So there's an old Templeton quote, you know, you want to be buying at times of maximum pessimism, selling at times of maximum optimism, but that goes to show why people are so horrific at investing. But this isn't not anything new. Um, some people were talking about bubbles early. GMO was talking about this. This is um, a, uh, a chart from Mark Faber. Uh, no relation. Um, I'm sure we share some blood somewhere, but the Swiss economist. And this is an early 18th century South Seas bubble. You know, we wrote a paper on bubbles a number of years ago called Learning to Love Investment Bubbles. This is an example of something that's been going on for many centuries. Um, this may look like a Bitcoin chart to some of you today. 
Um, but this also goes to show the behavioral biases have been around for a long time, including one of the world's most famous scientists, where Newton was investing in a, in a stock, doubled his money, sold, very happy, thinking about the, the nice places he was going to be vacationing on the French Riviera. Um, but then all of his friends started making more money than he was. Um, so of course, what does he do? He buys in near the top, has all the all sorts of other behavioral biases, missing out, and then fails to never sell until, of course, the, the direct bottom. And my point kind of about this is that um, as you're thinking about bubbles, the efficient market hypothesis says they don't exist. Or the corollary is if they do exist, there's nothing you can do ahead of time to identify them or protect yourself or hopefully to invest in their aftermath. Um, we disagree. But so is there any, and I'm a quant, you know, I'm an engineer by background, uh, is there anything you can do to remove this emotional decision making? First step is, you know, admitting you have a problem. I'm a terrible investor. Second step is, okay, what can I do to, to get around this? The first thing you can do is buy and hold. You know, we don't have a, a huge problem with buy and hold. Like John said, if you have a long enough time frame, 40 years, um, you know, many of us won't be around in 40, 50, 60 years, but hey, you'll probably have good returns. Um, that's one solution, but you have to sit through long bear markets, which is very painful. Many people can't do it. As you saw with Newton, the previous examples, they usually sell at the bottom. But one thing you can do is have a fundamental anchor. And I'm going to kind of um, run through this pretty quickly because John touched on a, a few of these things. These two good looking guys on the left, Ben Graham, on the right, recently crowned Nobel laureate, uh, Bob Schiller out of Yale. Um, ben Graham proposed over 70 years ago a method that he said, look, uh, to value stocks or securities, a great way to do it is just smooth earnings. And I think his preferred time frame is about five to seven years, but it, it lessened the effects of the business cycle. Things that were too uh, optimistic, as well as recessions and, and contractions, as well as expansions. Um, so this, is, this idea is nothing new. It's been around uh, essentially a century. Schiller popularized it in the 90s with a white paper called Irrational Exuberance. Um, somebody else made that phrase uh, a little more popular when they uh, uttered it, um, Alan Greenspan, and sent the markets into a brief, very brief tailspin. Um, and then wrote a book, the, the book, and then um, came up with this measure called, as John mentioned earlier, CAPE, 10-year uh, cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. And again, this is the chart going back to late 19th century. But as you kind of look about this and think about efficient markets, it seems to me a little bit strange to be thinking about it's just a, a good time to be investing here as it is here or here, right? Um, and you can see kind of Mr. Market, schizophrenic Mr. Market all over the place, um, you know, over time about how much people are willing to pay for stocks. Um, and in general, like many valuation metrics, it works. It's very simple over long time frames, 10 year returns. It's not rocket science. The more you pay for something, the worse your future returns are. The less you pay for something, the better they are. Very, very basic stuff. Again, it works over time. We're at a value of around 25. Um, for the nerds out there, is a scatter plot. Again, you can see this is important because it shows it still looks a little bit like a shotgun blast. Valuation doesn't explain everything. But over time, in general, the less you pay, the, the better your returns are. The more you pay, the worse they are. Um, this is a chart I posted in my blog, and ap apologies if it looks like a kind of bowl of Fruit Loops. I added a bunch of these yesterday, um, again, after some wine, so who, who knows what's coming. But all this is showing is there's four colors, dark green, light green, yellow, and red, representing those cape buckets. And on the far right is future returns. This is every year, you know, and, and you have the 15 to 20 percent bucket for the next 10 years, all the way down to, to slightly negative. Um, and what you can see in, in not paying attention to the numbers is that in general, the right side of the chart is mostly green and yellow. And the left side of the chart is mostly is uh, it's dark green and dark green. The left side is mostly red and yellow, although you still have some red eking on to the right side as well as some green eking on to the left side, going to show that valuation is not always perfect indicator, but in general, um, it's a good guide. If you look at the 10 worst times to invest in the 10 best in the past century. Um, the biggest takeaway is there's been good times, there's been bad times, but the valuation at the 10 best is closer to 10. You know, if you're looking to start a secular bull market, um, on average, it's, it's cheap valuations as well as a secular bear 
we're actually over that value right now. So if people are talking about, you know, this is the beginning of a secular bull market, that's going to be a challenging starting point because of the, the expense we're at. Um, you, this is a bad x-axis, but one of the caveats people talk a lot about is stocks are, quote, allowed to be a little more expensive right now because you're in this inflation safe zone, 1% to 4%, right? Um, so the PE multiples tend to be a little bit higher in that range. Where things really start to crater is you get up above 4%, and PE multiples really get hammered. Um, you know, we, we don't see much inflation now, around one and a half, two percent maybe, um, but things, you're kind of on the, the king of the mountain, right? And these are still, I mean, we're still up here, of course, <laughs> so it's, it's higher than this, but there is a slight bias to when things are, are um, tame. There's a lot of criticisms, uh, both good and bad, for, for CAPE ratios. Um, for example, one say the measurement period is too long. What's 10 years is not relevant to what's going on today. Um, the ideal period that we found is actually around seven years. Thanks, Ben Graham. Um, but it really doesn't matter. They all tend to work well. The worst is, is one year, which is what most people use. Um, and it's funny, because I'll get emails from investors. And depending on their market stance, whether they're bullish or bearish, they'll say, no, no, you can't use CAPE because it ignores like, you can't use CAPE because it includes 07, and that was bubble territory. It doesn't make any sense to be including that. And then on the opposite side, I'll get people, no, 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 Meb, you can't use 08. It doesn't make sense because it was depression era type of, type of earnings, and it biases. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, we, we did a study where we showed what if 2008 never happened? You just had a normal recession. It changes the CAPE by like two, two points. Um, so it really doesn't matter when you have a long enough time frame, uh, these, these fits and starts. Um, another criticism, Jeremy Siegel, I actually did a radio show with him last week. And we talked a little bit about this, talking about the differences in accounting changes. Are these structurally important? Does it matter? Reported versus operating earnings. So we went back, and this is actually kind of funny because we were trying to recreate his white paper. And I was having a very difficult time doing it, so we had a crowdsource research project. I said on my blog, if you could do this, um, we'll give you a free subscription to Idea Farm. Um, and I had about three analysts do it in about two days, which just is amazing. Um, but, and Siegel's been talking about a lot of this, a lot of speeches. It basically all it does is shift the, oh, sorry. He's using NEPA profits, we're a little, a little different, um, which all it does is have the effect of essentially just shifting the curve down. And so if you, even if you use his own metric, you come to the same conclusion, which is stocks are overvalued. Now, it's not as much as, as the Schiller Cape says, but they're still overvalued. And if you notice when he's giving his talks, he'll say, no, no, it removes almost all of the overvaluation and kind of mumbles and moves on. Um, but it comes to the same conclusion. And um, so anyway, it, it just goes to show even if you take a different accounting measure, um, it's, it's a very, very similar conclusion. This is one of John's charts. Um, the interesting thing about thinking about any valuation metric is it doesn't even really matter which one you use. Um, we replicated the studies coming up using price to book, price to sales, price to earnings, cash flow from the French Fama database came to all the same conclusions, broadly speaking. If you're using valuation, it's a blunt tool, but in general, they say the same thing. When you have a stock or a country that's really cheap, usually the indicators line up opposite on the, uh, also on the opposite side. But we like CAPE for, for other reasons. So this is, this is you know, thinking about risk and thinking about efficient markets and ignoring the fundamental anchor. You know, we, we say here, it's like uh, Arthur Ashe. Either you understand your risk or you don't play the game. So you want to be the mouse looking for this equity risk premium, looking for returns, but also trying to be smart about it and not do something really stupid. Um, you know, the old Warren Buffett rule, um, first rule, don't lose money. Second rule, don't forget the first rule. But so the problem we're faced with today, U.S. stocks are expensive, um, you know, low single digits, maybe negative, not great, bonds, same thing, 2%. What else are you faced with? What do you do with your money? So one of the things we did is we said, all right, well, why don't we go recreate this CAPE ratio? We hadn't seen anyone else do it um, for the rest of the world, and let's look at what we may find. You know, I'm an engineer. I say, I, I, I will reserve my judgment until we get some of the data. Um, and so we went back and created this for now over 55 countries. Uh, and again, this, there's a few things to take away from this chart. Uh, it's a little confusing, but in general, a lot of the valuations move together. However, there is still a very wide spectrum of returns. Um, 
you have times when there's things that are trading countries, trading at really low valuations and really high ones. Um, I'm sure everyone can identify what this is, the biggest bubble we've ever seen. Japan in the late 1980s um, hit a value of almost 100. Uh, and so a lot of people talk about Japan and they say, well, it's done poorly because of demographics or they're less competitive or there's birth rates declining or China's emerging, whatever it is. Whoa, they've been working off the biggest bubble and it took them 20 years. Typically it only work, it takes, I don't know, seven years to, to work off a bubble, even less for, depends on the magnitude, it took Japan 20s. And we talk about lost decades, it's just because of how expensive they were. Um, if you go back to late 2007, um, everyone was so excited about the BRICS. Uh, China was trading at a value, I think, around 60, 65 maybe. Everyone loved China. China's taking over the world. They're growing at a gazillion percent a year. Um, and the irony is everyone hates China now, and China's valuation is much, much, much lower than it was in 07. Same thing for India, but one of the reasons returns have been so poor. Is this predictive of future returns? That's all that really matters. Um, works just the same as it does in the U.S. Uh, the lower, less you pay, the better it is. The more you pay, the worse it is. The red lines right now are where IFA and emerging are, um, right around 15. Emerging is actually a little cheaper um, than, than IFA, which is a little bit more, but better positions than where the U.S. is. Um, and again, does it work? Uh, historically, we go back to 80, um, find that you know, equal weight, pretty good returns, investing in the cheapest, even better, investing in the most expensive, really dumb. Um, you can add, there's things you can do to improve this even more. Uh, we'll talk about those in a minute. And then, by the way, EFA returns are going to be even less. They're down a few more percent. I'm flying through this. I take a, um, as you think about, and this is just a simple yearly rebounds, you know, looking at all these countries, investing in the top 25% of these countries, sorry, I got ahead of myself, top 25% of the universe, um, historically, the equity curve, uh, the red line does better than buy and hold of all countries, which does better than the expensive. Again, it's not rocket science. One of the things we added this is we said, well, does it make sense to be paying, to be just investing in the cheapest 25% when everything's expensive, right? That, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So you add in a filter and say, we're only taking country if it's below a cape of around 17. You know, the, the average over time, I think, is around 16 and a half, 17. Uh, and so we said, we're not going to, we'll move that portion to cash. What it does, you get the same return, which is the blue line, um, with a little bit lower volatility and drawdowns, though you can have some dispersion, right? Years where one does better than others. Um, let's talk about when things are um, really good and really bad. And so looking at the historical database, when there's true blood in the streets um, and then a true bubble, this is, 45 is basically the highest the U.S. ever hit in the late 90s, but there is a handful of examples of these countries, a lot of them are smaller, but also much more volatile, that have had even greater bubbles, Japan being the greatest example, but also on the opposite side, um, truly w what's really bloody. And typically, it's a great thing to be doing. Um, you know, Templeton, again, said, I want to be investing where things are most miserable, not where things are great. Uh, you're asking the wrong question. He's like, don't ask where things are great, ask where they're miserable. And in general, investing when things are really cheap works out for the next five years. Um, investing when things are really expensive doesn't work out. Efficient market hypothesis disagrees. Where are we now? Um, this is an interesting chart. We update this every quarter. I have been doing so since um, early summer of 2011, maybe. I can't remember. Um, we also include some frontier markets, which we don't think there's a lot of um, reliability. Uh, if, you, if you just use developed and emerging, we think it's a better indicator. Um, if you look at the left side of this chart, it's the who's who of absolute most nauseous geopolitical headlines. Makes you sick to even look at these. Um, I would not suggest going home to your clients, your wife, your husband and saying, you know what, I heard this great speech by Meb. Um, I think we need to be buying Greece and Russia. Uh, you'll probably get fired or slapped. But the good news is that's part of the reason why it works, right? No one wants to be buying these countries. No one wants to be buying these stocks. On the right, everyone wants to be buying these countries. I was highly unpopular in Mexico and Colombia last year um, when I said, look, I love your country. People are beautiful. I, I, the food's great. Your stock markets are on the more expensive side uh, uh, around the world. It's, and then everyone proceeds to tell you why this time is different. You don't understand the pension funds are channeling in X amount of money per month, yada, 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 yada. But in general, the valuation will be a headwind. U.S. was one of the most, I think, it darts around between the most expensive in the world 
um, and one of the closest. Um, the lowest value we've ever seen was Greece in the summer of 2012. Uh, it hit a value of two, and then Japan is the highest at um, almost 90. Um, and interesting, even though emerging markets as an index are cheaper than developed markets, most of the cheapest countries are in developed. Most of the cheapest countries fall in the Eurozone, uh, a lot of emerging Europe, Austria, Hungary, Czech, um, Italy, Spain. And where things, one of the again, reasons this works so well, if you start to think back the last five years, is when things go from truly horrific, worst headlines every day to slightly less bad. So let's, let's take a couple examples. Greece, not as many people are talking about Greece anymore as they were in 2012 or 2011 when they were talking about it exiting the Euro, not paying their debts, um, you know, basically dropping into the Mediterranean, and people talk less about it today. Um, Italy is one of the best performing stock markets in the world this year. No one's talking about Italy anymore. Spain, um, a lot of Europe's doing great. Now, there's, there's someone that everyone's talking about right now, um, Russia, which is a great example of things you hear when markets have been destroyed. And, and going back to thinking about CAPE ratios, the large determinant of this is simply the price. It's not the earnings. The price is highly volatile. These correlate very highly with drawdowns, how far these markets have already declined. So typically what you're, just in bu you're buying is markets that have already declined by 40 to 80%. And typically, these are going to be close to a drawdown of around zero. They're going to be markets that are, that are hitting new highs. Um, and here's just, a, here's just an example to give you some perspective. This is Greece for the past 10, 15 years. And it's you know, all over the place. But in general, you find at times when it's cheaper or lower, 5, 17, 2, 4 now, we're up here. And then times when it's expensive, late 90s, it was at a very high valuation. Not terrible here, but certainly higher. Um, but this also illustrates the pros and cons of a value investing approach. You know, is what's called the investing, on, catching a falling knife, right? Um, last night at dinner, I was talking about the, the famous investing joke, what do you call something down 90%? That's something down 80% and then gets cut in half again, right? So there's still a lot of risk when valuations are cheap. So at one point, you could be in by, by buying Greece when it was 10, 8, 6, 4, 2, when it theoretically was cheap, but it kept getting cheaper. Um, it's not the point of this talk, but those who know me know I'm a huge fan of trend following, uh, of, of, of momentum in general. My favorite intersection is value and momentum when things are cheap, but also starting to go up. You don't have that yet in Russia. Um, you have it in Italy. You have it in Spain. You may be having it, hopefully, in, in Brazil. Um, but anyway, this is a good example of also the risks involved in this, right? And, and this is any valuation strategy. It has nothing to do with CAPE but just valuation in general. And this is um, just an example from last year. Just to give you some perspective, you probably can't read this. This is where CAPES at the end of 2012 and how they did in 2013. And in general, if you bought the bottom 10, you had a nice 20% return. If you bought the top 10 most expensive, you had a negative return. There's one outlier in each section. Um, in the cheapest, Russia, um, was it a CAPE of seven? Now it's at a CAPE of six, maybe even cheaper now. Um, they had a negative return, and then the U.S. is the outlier on the expensive countries. It was at a CAPE of 21. And 2013 is a great example of how challenging it is to be looking at one country or, or a binary sort of event. The only difference, and, and this is the thing, I, and it's not particularly helpful to investors, but it's helpful to think in terms of what's possible. The U.S. has had a CAPE of anywhere from 5 to 45. Either of those values are possible going forward. The only difference is what people are willing to pay. And we have a great Vonnegut qu quote in the book and say it's only difference is people's opinion of the place. You have to be mentally prepared for the possibility, however small, of a increase in PE ratios to 45 and the stock market doubling from here. Not quite doubling. But you also have to be prepared for a decline of 80%. Now, most people like to think in binary terms in stocks, either I'm, I'm out and I'm long, I mean, I'm, it, stocks are cheap and they're a buy, or I'm out and it's a sell, but there's a full range of pro future probabilities. As kind of John showed earlier in the chart, you know, the more stocks go up, you're just mortgaging part of your future returns. They go from 5% expected returns to four to three to two to one. Um, but in general, uh, let's look at the world. This is average CAPE valuations across the whole world. Um, 
and this is going to be a little bit biased to smaller countries, of course, not GDP. Um, so they'll, but in general, it's kind of a fun guide as to what's going on in the world. Early 80s, best possible time to be buying in my, in my career. Um, everything was cheap. And then you had things getting more expensive for a lot of the 90s and 2000s. Um, much of foreign has not participated in a lot of the last um, uh, number of years. So broadly, markets are on, on the cheaper side. Why this matters to you, and this is important. At the very minimum, if you are a Bogle, Vanguard, diehard indexer, and you do the global portfolio, US is 45%, okay? At a minimum, you should have 54% in foreign markets. No one ever does. It's called home country bias. It happens all over the world. The average allocation in the US is 70% to US stocks. The average allocation, if you're Italian, to Italian stocks is 70%. Average allocation in Australia, same thing. It's a worse setup abroad because the US is a majority of market cap, but um, it's still a problem in the US. So I pass around the sheet. There's good and bad news. Bad news, you still have home country bias. The average and median is right around 61% for this crowd. Well, this crowd's a little more of an outlier than the last six speeches I gave, which are all around 75 to 80%. Um, so it's a good thing, pat yourself on the back, but um, it's, uh, there's still a bias in there. Now, this matters even more right now. First of all, GDP weighted US is only around 20, 25% of the world. Um, but why this matters particularly now is what's the most expensive? Well, it's this. Half your portfolio, or if you're home country biased, 70% is in the most expensive country in the world. Um, and if you think that isn't a big deal, well, going back to Japan's bubble, and I lined up the bubbles of the US just to show how massive this Japanese bubble was. And Japan really didn't get back to a fa fair valuation. I, sorry about the x-axis. I did this other night. So this is, um, actually, this is right. This is a number of months um, you know, until the last few years. And this is that little cute 50% run they had last year. But still, it just goes showing the greater scheme of things, just how big this was. Japan here was half a world's market cap in the late 80s. And it might have even been more. It may have hit 60% at one point. Um, but had you been a global investor, you would have had a massive drag on returns for the next 20 years. This is one of the reasons equal weighting or value weighting works versus market cap weighting. Um, the first best thing you can do is avoid market cap weighting. This chart is from Ned Davis. This is the S&P 500. This is a simple example is if you had just invested in the largest market cap stock, whenever the, whatever the largest market cap stock was. So AT&T, Apple, Cisco, Exxon, GE. IBM, Microsoft, Walmart, it's a horrible idea. And it makes sense, you know, that's capitalism, right? When you're the biggest, you're making the most money, you have a huge target on your back. People are, you know, Apple, world changing products, but all of a sudden you have Samsung, all of a sudden you have Google, a lot of people competing. Um, Rob Arnott at Research Affiliates found that if you simply invested in the largest market cap stock, you underperform the market by 3% a year for the next 10 years. This also happens in every sector. So if, you inv so if you're doing market cap weighting, you have an unintentional overvaluation bias. But that's the same thing globally. If you're gonna invest in stocks around the world and you're doing a market cap portfolio, the most expensive country in the world is the US. Um, I think this is about it. Uh, this is another chart, um, and this is kind of like a Bollinger Bands of valuations, but it shows the US is, always isn't the most expensive, right? So. Right now, it's out, actually outside of the upper valuation range of the 25% uh, most expensive, 25% cheapest. But it goes to show it's kind of a nice, um, broad overview of where we stand relative to the rest of the world. And right now, it's more expensive than the rest of the world. But that wasn't always the case. For most of the 80s, we were one of the cheapest markets. And shockingly, this is one of the best bull markets we've ever had. Um, but it just gives you a little bit of perspective of, of where we are over time. Um, I'm going to skip over most of this, but there's ways to think about it. You know, Robert Schuller has done a lot of work with sectors. Shows this works great with sectors as well. Uh, he launched a product in, in partnership with Barclays that does um, a sector ETF or ETN. Um, he does it a little different, and I actually don't r agree with him. Um, he compares them to their own history, saying, and there's part of this makes sense, saying that you know utilities may deserve a lower multiple than maybe tech stocks. Um, the challenge comes with bubbles, right? And Japan's a great example. If you just compare Japan to its own history, you're gonna be investing 
with an average and median up in 50, 60, 70 for a long time, right? And it doesn't quite make sense to compare. Um, to me, it makes sense to compare kind of all of them in a similar method, but um, a lot of people disagree. Again, would an ensemble model work better? This works just as, not quite as good, but it works with dividends. You take dividend, sort, sort, sort by dividend yield. My favorite investing book of all time, Triumph, Triumph of the Optimist, um, has studies that go back just sort on dividend yield. Most expensive to least expensive beats by 8% a year. Um, so you could use a number, a, a, a composite of various valuation indicators. And then what about adding momentum and trend? You know, our fund doesn't use momentum or trend because we like to keep it simple. I am a full supporter of that. It's my favorite intersection. Um, I really love uh, cheap things that are starting to go up and have better momentum, um, but we think that's a great idea. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, happy to entertain questions. Great. Um, <clears throat> I'll start with one question, and then we'll just turn it over to the audience. Um, my question is, you mentioned a little bit about the sectors, that you, that's kind of a further area of inquiry, and there's some work being done there. Does presumably certain sectors have lower PEs than others? And does that, and, and then as we know, certain countries have very different makeups of sectors within their public equity markets. So the question is, is, is there something there that, you know, a country with a lot of energy components, for example, or finance or something that might have a lower cape, make the country have an otherwise lower well, PE? There's, there's a couple comments. And I, I think there's a lot you could do to, to fiddle with and improve these very basic indicators. Um, but one of the reasons they work well, and there's a, a few things, one, you should always do a, a basket, you know, not, not just go buy Greece or Russia or just financials. Um, and two is that what's important is you're not just buying the cheapest, you're also avoiding the most expensive, right? So even if you just bought the bottom half of the universe, it's important because you're avoiding, you're just skimming the, the junk off the top, right? Um, so there's a lot you can do, and there's a lot that other people do do. A new academic paper came out from one of the banks that adjusts for CAPE by saying some countries have a higher sector exposure in certain sectors that are lower growth that deserve a, a lower CAPE. It, it makes me a little uncomfortable, honestly, um, and I'd reserve the right to be completely wrong on this topic um, and change my mind, but it, it makes me uncomfortable because of the bubble and depression bias, right? In Japan, perfect example. Tech's a perfect example. If you say, well, we're just gonna compare tech to its own history. Well, you have this massive bubble that's gonna have an outlier impact on that for a long time. And same thing with Japan. You would have been buying Japan all the way down because it was cheap relative to its history. So in general, we like to just buy a cheap basket. What's, what's the right percentage? I don't know, 25, 30%. Um, but Schiller does do that with his ETF. We found it didn't really make it much of a difference, um, ironically, but it conceptually makes sense. So if any of you do some research, let me know. I'd love to be proven wrong. All right. Yeah, Mike. Um, currencies, oh boy, this is a great question. Um, it's the question is about what do you, how do you deal with currency It's risk? a seemingly simple question with a very long answer, um, but I'll, I'll tackle it in a couple um, parts. Real currency r returns tend to be fairly stable over time. All right, so if you have a long-term perspective um, and assume you have no ability to forecast currency returns, then I'm agnostic. You can say you either choose one or the other. You either choose to hedge your currency risk or you don't. With equities, I don't think it matters as much. Um, with bonds, I think it matters a lot because you're introducing currency volatility into an asset class that's, that's lower volatility. Um, we ran this study both from a perspective of a US investor as well as local currencies. It didn't make much difference. Um, the next follow-on question is, can you treat, can you have models that are predictive of what currencies do. And I think you can. I think you come up with very simple index-like strategies, value, momentum, trend, the most famous being carry, the worst probably diversifier to a portfolio, and interest rates um, that work great to predict currency returns. But that's almost, are you treating it as an entirely separate asset class? So we don't hedge any of the currency um, risk because we think it'll wash out over time, keyword being over time. But if Somebody comes to me with 100 million and wants to do a hedged currency one. We would certainly do it. I'm agnostic to it, but um, we don't we don't we don't do it. But found returns to be similar in either way. Uh, question? Yeah. Sure. Um, most of the conversation is about what to buy. Um, in terms of what, if you think the overall markets are are overpriced, 
And I would think the first question you'd ask is, what is what's the best thing to short? Um, shorting. The question is there was, value to be added on shorting. The question is, what do you do? And uh, what, what do you do? Do you short? Um, shorting's tough. Shorting's really tough. Um, and in general, if you're doing market neutral style portfolios where you're long something and short something, it's it's also tough. Uh, we actually think most of the world's cheap. So um, we're buying, so our fund, for example, we have an ETF that does this, buys the 11 cheapest countries. Then it takes the top 30 market cap, so the biggest stocks, and then takes the 10 cheapest within those. So you know, with a portfolio of around 100 stocks. That's mostly developed countries right now, and I'm very comfortable with being long those. However, the biggest country in the world largest by GDP and market cap, if it sneezes and goes down 50%, will all these countries remain unscathed? No, of course not. They'll probably decline just as much as the US. Um, hopefully less, but, but, it, but it could be more. It becomes more of a, of a broad philosophical question, and, but if you have a long time frame, I'm very comfortable being in foreign equities. But there's, a, and here's another important part. If you think of just broad foreign developed, Right? There's a lot of variations in, in the valuations with that. US, one of the more expensive, or various countries. Greece, well, Greece now may be emerging, depending on which index provider you use. Um, but there's a lot of cheap countries within each. Same thing with emerging. You may have Indonesia, Colombia being expensive, but a lot of other countries, Brazil, Russia being cheap. So buying a broad index, even though emerging may be cheap, doesn't give you the full exposure of what a value index may be. And there's a lot of ways to do it, a lot of different um, Fund companies will, will do value-based, but you're getting single-digit PEs in a lot of countries around the world. Um, hopefully, they start to re-rate at some point and the multiples get higher, but uh, the biggest problem with um, correlations now in a globalized world is, is simply that. They're high, higher correlated, so we expect, we would think foreign would outperform a lot versus the US, um, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I thought the question was going to, to when do you decide to sell? If you see something's overvalued, what do you do? So, so the example that we do is that we have an absolute filter, right? So if the cape is above 18, we're not taking that country. So if you have a scenario where all of the countries are above 18, we would be sitting in cash or moving parts of that portfolio to cash because we don't want to be in something that's simply cheap when everything else is expensive. And historically, that's helped. It, it hasn't totally shielded you um, from 2008, for example, but uh, it, it has helped reduce volatility and drawdown. It takes, the, it takes the drawdown by about almost half. But from a practical standpoint, what you could be doing, you could be using trend following, for sure, as an exit, right? Um, trend following helps more when markets are expensive than it does when simply they're cheap. Um, you know, we don't do any shorting, but... Are you saying when Italy is 18, you're out? We would be, and we only rebalance this portfolio once a year. Um, deep value st style strategies, the more you actually rebalance, the worse it is. Um, so you could even rebalance this every two years, right? Um, and it doesn't matter that much. Uh, but it uh, theoretically, yeah. But, but that's not going to happen for a while in foreign. A lot of those foreign markets are single digit, single digit PEs. Are you equal weighting the 11 cheapest countries that you own, or are you weighting them based on something no, else? No, we like do. How cheap um, they are? We, we, we equal weight. Uh, the, um, the challenge being some of the countries are small. Of course, Czechoslovakia doesn't even have 30 companies that pass $200 million liquidity. Mm. We actually love the, the, the Czech market, but. Um, it, uh, so some will have a smaller representation simply because they don't have enough companies, uh, which has the potential for more volatility, of course, right? When you're, when you're in, and we don't include Frontier. Our data provider actually just stopped updating the Frontier <laughs> markets, so we, don't, we can't even update them anymore. Um, as much fun as that it is to track what Argentina, how low can they go, uh, we can't anymore, sadly. You mentioned correlations a little bit. Um, can you make any general statements or specific ones about what countries or groups of countries are least correlated with U.S. returns? So which countries or groups of countries are least correlated with the U.S. returns? When, when we do all of our modeling, if you're thinking about equities, we assume, worst case, that all equities be 100% correlated. Um, a a follow-on question we often get, which is very similar to what I think you're asking, is that people say, well, Meb, you know, the U.S.'s influence, that the U.S. is overvalued and how that affects. 
the U.S. gets half of its sales from abroad. So actually, my allocation is not as bad as you think. But my response to that is always, well, if you're, you, where do you think the abroad gets a lot of their sales from too, right? They have exposure to the U.S. and it's a very intertwined world. But if you assume correlations are high, um, which we do and can't and will, could stay high, you want to be investing, in my opinion, what's the cheapest? Now, there's things you could further do. What industries have lower correlation, what sectors do, what countries may. Um, those are all interesting sorts of sorts of things. Um, but it's tough, you know? I mean, do you want to be investing in Egypt for the past year? I just got more flamed on Twitter than I ever have talking about Egypt, um, which we have no position in. Uh, but as an example of a market where the headlines start to kind of fade away, and the equity market does amazing. But um, you, the, the further and smaller you get with the emerging and frontier markets, the less correlation they'll have. But a lot of that's simply because they're highly volatile and tiny. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. huge. Go ahead, take one more now. I think. Uh, you talked about how focusing on large caps has led to underperformance over time. But right now, aren't um, small caps um, relatively even more overvalued than generally? Um, I think the question about large cap versus small cap opportunity set and how market cap, large cap weighting historically um, has been a suboptimal thing to do. Going back to our first chart, it changes over time, right? So right now, small caps relative to large caps are some near or above the most expensive they've ever been. So do you want to be allocating to small caps? And the irony is in the U.S. market, large caps, the sweet spot we think is mid caps, but it changes over time. In the late 90s, it was the exact opposite. The fat pitch was dividends and small caps, but it was a market cap driven bubble. So John was showing a couple of charts that show, for example, average and median valuations. And that will give you perspective on where the, the froth is coming from. And right now, it's small caps, for, for sure. Um, consumer discretionary uh, was the highest cape we had coming into this year, and they're underperforming by a lot. And so that's part of the thing about you have to kind of pick and choose your spots as you monitor these indicators over time because it changes, as and especially due to money flows, right? And right now, that's a lot of small caps. And as a um, sentiment indicator, most of my friends have no interest in investing until the last three months. Starting to get the cocktail party chatter again, so use that, use that as you may. Cocktail party and M&A chatter. A lot of companies starting to do M&A, which happens at near market tops. All right, well, let's thank uh, Meb here. and. Um, we're going to have uh, John and Stephanie come on stage, and I'll let John take the lead and hopefully do some bridging of the worlds of economies and markets.